Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Gordy, and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. And I'm sober today through the grace of God and this wonderful fellowship. My sobriety date's 11th of April 1977, and for that I'm very, very grateful. And thank you for the nice and the kind words as you led me in, Janice. Uh, it's always good to make a fuss of people and, and uh, be thankful and show our gratitude. And, and I owe this program, I owe this fellowship a lot, because this program saved my life. And I can never ever re- reiterate that enough. It saved my life, you know. And, and that is, um, you know, absolutely true. And when I came into these rooms and um, I fell in the door, I virtually fell in the door, I was in such a mess. Uh, I had 13 warrants for my arrest and, and uh, coppers were after me. Other people were after me for their money. I had a double bankruptcy, and all I was doing was uh, drinking my life away, living to drink and drinking to live. It was just like a broken record. I couldn't do a damn thing about it. But when the time was right, when I got so far down that there was nowhere else to go but up, I cried out for help. But that's a long story. I might go back to the start. Um, I was born in um, July 1947. I was born in Sydney uh, to uh, parents uh, Yvonne and my father Don. And um, as a young kid, you know, I my um, fears and uh, low self-esteem and uh, and the ability to mix and communicate was very evident right from the very beginning at school, uh, right through my childhood, you know, I just couldn't express myself. So when that first drink came along, I thought it was a magic potion that was going to get me through life, steamroll, my, uh, steamroll myself through life. And things were a bit uh, different in those days compared to what they are now. Uh, my childhood was spent in the years after the war. And um, lifestyle was a hell of a lot different. But how I picked up that first drink, um, I wouldn't go to school. And my father said, if you're not going to go to school, you're going to go to work. So he took me down to Port Adelaide and got me some medicals and uh, I went through a few tests and stuff like that, colour blind tests and all that kind of stuff and uh, then I was put on a roster to wait for a ship and it wasn't long in coming because at uh, April the 2nd, 1962, the day I was in the bar and we never had the telephone on and there was a phone call to go and... Um, answer this uh, uh, telephone next door in the lady's place next door and I went inside there and it was a shipping master from Port Adelaide and he said uh, we've got a ship for you if you want to take it it's a vessel called the Iron Monarch a BHP, the, a BHP iron ore vessel and it was trading out of Australia and um, they needed a deck boy and I said I'd take it well, I never had much time to do anything else then. There was a taxi waiting on my doorway, um, uh, on my doorstep within an hour. I had to pack a few things together in a bag and uh, head off to the airport. That's how quick it was. And I was only 14, you know. And there's no way a kid can leave school at the age of 14 today. I think the school age is 16. Uh, here I was, 14. Very young 14 at that too. And and I was plonked on my first ship. I flew up to Wyala in one of those old Dakota 
uh, aircraft, those old uh, Second World War aircraft. They used to transport troops around in, the old DC-3. And uh, I went up there and signed on. I went down to the ship. And uh, I'll never forget that day. All these strange people. You know, I was taken straight out of school and shoved on a ship. <laughs> and um, in a couple of days, you know, after um, settling down a bit, uh, we sailed. And we headed from Wyala uh, to Port Canberra, it was, to Port Canberra on the east coast of Australia. And I never forget, we were sailing down the, the coast, down the Gulf, and I thought, gee, this is a great life, you know. The sun shining, blue sea, and we're just rolling about there. It was so nice. But little did I know that we were only in the Gulf. We hadn't even got out to sea yet, you know. And when we passed Cape Willoughby Light on the eastern point of Kangaroo Island, <laughs> that's when I got introduced to the Great Southern Ocean. <laughs> and it wasn't very nice. And I spent the next four or five days heaving up over the side, you know, or threw up all over the place, uh, day in, day out. I think I spent that first first few days in the bunk. But um, as time went by, I got used to seasickness and about two months, and, and all of a sudden it was gone, you know. It didn't bother me anymore. But that first trip, we sailed from Wyala and we went to Newcastle, and um, no, Port Kembla, sorry. We went on to Newcastle after that. But I went ashore in Port Kembla with the, the guys on board this ship. And they said to me, you want to come up the road, son? And I jumped up and went with them. We jumped in a taxi and we went to a hotel called the Seven Seas Hotel in uh, Carrington in Newcastle. And that's where I picked up my first drink. I remember that night pretty well, you know, that first hour or two. There was the music, jukeboxes, and, and uh, there was women in there, and there was drinking, and all this stuff, you know. Oh, I thought I was on top of the mountain. Then all of a sudden I went into blackouts. I don't remember anything more. It was just that first hour or two. And then I woke up in the back of a car with two guys. And one guy was driving, and this other guy was sitting in the back with me. And he was going through my pockets. And I took offence to it, and um, this guy started bashing me about, you know. And next minute, you know, it must have stirred all that alcohol up that I drank earlier on, and I threw up <laughs> all over this bloke that was giving me hiding. And he didn't take too kindly to that, I can tell you. And uh, next minute... While his mate was driving, he's got his foot up against the door, and, uh, up against me with the door open, and he kicked me out on the road. And that was my introduction to alcohol, you know. And I remember waking up from all that, you know, stuck in the monks of mangroves there in Newcastle. And I walked back towards the ship. I could see these lights in the distance. And I walked back towards these lights, and that was the port of Newcastle, and I could see my ship there, and I was bruised and battered, and, you know, from uh, the punches in the head that I got from the guy in the back of the car, and then plus when I was kicked out on the road, and, and the scratches and abrasions and stuff like that. And I went to the blokes on board the ship, and I wanted some sympathy, but they, they wouldn't be in it. They didn't care less, you know. This is your life, sonny. You, you want to live this kind of lifestyle, you've got to toughen up. And uh, so I had to uh, had to get a bit of, bit of oomph into me. But that was my first drink. And you'd think after a drink like that, you'd never, ever drink again. But I did, because I remember those first couple of hours the euphoria and feeling uplifted and and I never felt like that before in my life. But um, anyway, I drank on for the next 15 years and and my drinking was blackout drinking. It, it wasn't, um, you know, a couple of pints of beer, grab the newspaper and go home or anything like that. When I drank, I couldn't stop. I'd drink all night long. I'd drink too. I couldn't. 
get another drop in me. I'd wake up uh, on the floor, I'd wake up anywhere. And later on I'd be in jails and lock-ups and I was such a mess, you know. I was like a ship without a compass. Uh, I wouldn't have a clue where in the hell I'd been or where I was going or where I was now, you know. Once I picked up that first drink, I was forced to continue. But that's the way it was in my whole life, you know. But um, getting towards the stage where I stopped drinking, I was in the last few months, uh, I was locked up in Port Adelaide uh, cells there one night. I woke up around about five, six o'clock in the morning and I could hear other drunks in there with me. I could hear the cars and the trucks going past outside and uh, I could hear the urinals running, you know, all those telltale signs of waking up in a lock-up. And uh, I thought, what in the hell am I stuck in this dirty, rotten, filthy joint again for, you know? It's been so many times that I've woke up like that. Uh, and I cried out for help. Someone or something to get me out of that hell I was going through. Who it was or what it was, I have no clues. Well, at that time I didn't. But I was just sick and tired of this lifestyle. And I wanted out of it. So I guess that was a prayer. I cried out for help. And I believe, you know, like old Gil says in Adelaide, no sincere prayer in earnest goes unanswered. And it was a, it was a genuine prayer. It was a sincere prayer. I cried out for help. I had enough of that kind of way of living. And, and I believe that the man upstairs did help me because a few weeks after that, a friend of mine that I used to drink with in the past, who I hadn't seen for a long time, uh, we met up down the road one day and, and I looked at him and I said, geez, mate, what's happened to you? I haven't seen you looking this good for a long time. He had a haircut and a clean shirt on, nice pair of pants. And the last time I seen him was maybe a year or two before that. And he was living under a couple of sheets of corrugated iron, laying up alongside a, a fence at the back of a, a football field. And he'd been there for quite some time and he was drinking methylated spirits. Now you guys in the US, that's that industrial spirits or white spirits. He was drinking that and he was sleeping in his clothes and he had an old black duffel coat and that was his blanket. And I hadn't seen this guy for a long time and I said, geez, what's happened to you, pal? You look good. And he said, I've stopped drinking and I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. He said, I'm in a rehab in Port Adelaide. Well, that didn't mean that much to me right there and then, but, um, we hadn't seen each other for a long time. We both had a common bond. Uh, uh, we loved fishing, and so we started going fishing again. And, and while we were fishing, he used to tell me about Alcoholics Anonymous. And he'd tell me about the people. He'd tell me about the meetings. He'd tell me about all kinds of stuff. And that must have been going in my memory banks for the time when I was ripe for the picking because uh, a few months later, Easter time, 1977, and I was having another real bad time in my life. And I drank all Easter. I was locked up on the Saturday night. And on the Sunday, uh, the Monday morning, I was laying in bed and, um, and these hangovers and stuff, you know, they were getting real bad. Uh, sweating and shaking and shivering and, and seeing all sorts of fancy things, uh, the, the DTs and all that kind of stuff. And I was laying there and I was thinking, you know, is a bloke going to do this for the rest of his life? How do I break this cycle? What do I do? And I said to my wife, you know, um, maybe I might go to one of those meetings that, um, that Kenny's been talking about. And she took it right from me right there and then. She, I didn't have to do another damn thing. She got on the telephone and I rang this fella up. And he said, hang on, I'll be there shortly. And he came down and he sat on the bed and he said, do you want to do a meeting? And me being the kind of guy that I am, I make those statements, but to, to be actually to be able to do them is another thing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, we got talking. That was the main thing. And uh, he came down every night that week. Every night that week he was 
on my doorstep asking me, would you like to go to a meeting? And I kept putting it off, putting it off and putting it off and I said, all right, I'll go to that one that you go to on Sunday night. Now I knew Sunday night was about six days off and, and I knew it was over at the rehab. Anyway, I said it and he was there, as I said, every day of that week. He wouldn't let me off the hook. So eventually Sunday night came around and I had to go and uh, I got cold feet. I wanted to back out. I wanted a drink to be able to go there and back, but uh, he said, we're going, and off we went, you know, and all sorts of strange things went through my mind, thinking about what's going to happen when I get in that door, uh, who's going to be there, what are they going to say, we're going to sit down and have some exams or something or other, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, it was nothing like that. I'll never forget that day, you know, I arrived over there with Kenny and there was a bloke working on uh, his car out the front, so I stopped and I spoke to him for a few minutes and we just chatted and that kind of calmed me down and quieted me down a little bit and then we walked in the doors and, and there was these beautiful people there on the other side. There was uh, old Judy and her husband Joe and uh, uh, Checker, Tommy T, all these people. You know, you've got them, the same people in, in your meetings, especially at that first meeting you guys ever went to. Those people that come up to you and offered you encouragement and kind words. But they did that for me. They came up to me and said, uh, how you doing, how you feeling, and all this kind of stuff. Just get yourself a cup of coffee and sit back and relax and listen to the meeting. And they never put no pressure on me. It was all encouragement. And I needed that at the time. I, if you put pressure on me, I would have took off at a hundred mile an hour. But these people were very kind and they were encouraging and they were compassionate. And I sat there and I listened to that first meeting and, and it done me well. You know, nothing was said that unnerved me or unsettled me. I listened to the stories of these people, their experience, strength and hope. And I kind of related a little bit on that very first meeting. And I'll never forget Judy saying to me, you know, at the end of the meeting, she said to me, um, I just got to get to such and such a meeting tomorrow night. And what she was actually doing was trying to get me to say, I'll take you. And in that way, she was getting me to another meeting. And she was crafty, this lady. Uh, and I understand what she was doing today. I didn't understand then. But anyway, <laughs> we got along to another meeting the next night and uh, it was good for me. And I came in and I sat back and I listened and, and I heard a few things that I could relate to. And It took a little while before the penny actually dropped because in those days when I was coming to these meetings I was saying, my name's Gordy and I'm an observer because I was still in denial. The fact didn't hit me I, that I was an alcoholic right there and then. I came to, to a number of meetings and I sat back and I listened. And it wasn't till probably six months in that the doubts started to uh, dissipate. And I was asked up to speak at a meeting in Port Adelaide one night and it was Judy's husband, Joe, and he said, uh, Gordy, you've been coming to these meetings for quite a while now. What about you come out the front and just say your name and, and then sit down and identify. And uh, I was full of fear, you know. I needed a drink to, to operate. I needed a drink to do anything up until that point in time. But somehow, some way, I got out of that chair that night and I walked up to the front, and for the first time in my life, and I can remember it today as if it was yesterday, I said, my name is Gordy, and I'm an alcoholic. And I remember the, the, the feeling that had come over me, you know. I had said these words. I've been pondering for, for a long time, but I finally had said it. My name is Gordy, and I'm an alcoholic. And the fact was, I not only admitted it, that I was an alcoholic, but I had some quick flash, momentary flashbacks of the past. I was thinking about, you know, every 
piece of crap that I'd got up to, everything that happened to me in all those years, all the rotten stuff, you know, has happened because I picked up a drink on any one of those days. And if I hadn't have picked up a drink, that wouldn't have happened to me. The reality hit me. Yes, I am an alcoholic. And I can't alter that fact. Not one iota. But I can do something about it. You know, when I hear, listen, and I hear you people say, I can arrest this disease one day at a time using the program, the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the big book, the basic text of AA. You tell me all these things. And even back in those days, I understood a little bit about it. And, and from that day on, I accepted the fact that I was an alcoholic. And I listened to old people, older sober members like Tommy T and the Raucous Dick and Broken Hill Jack and all these people around then. And old Tommy, used, he had a classic saying, a real classic saying. And, uh, and if I say it in these rooms, it didn't come from me. It came from old Tommy. And Tommy used to say, when a boxer throws in the towel, he loses a fight. But when an alcoholic throws in the towel... He wins a fight. And that was very profound for me. You know, you could hit me with all this technical jargon, all this, the big words and everything like that. You'd never get through to me. But simple little things like what Tommy said, you know, when the boxer throws in the towel, he loses a fight. But when the alcoholic throws in the towel, he wins a fight. I got an understanding from that. That uh, it's about surrendering. Admitting and accepting, uh, admitting defeat and accepting the fact that I'm an alcoholic and get rid of the denial because the denial had plagued me for 15 years. It was the denial that was killing me through this disease. Alcoholism is a fatal disease. I'll never forget that. It was hanging on a banner at a rehab that I, I went to and it was hanging up over the stage and it was, sorry, it was stark. It hit me right between the eyes when I walked in. Alcoholism is a fatal disease. It will kill us if we let it. And I heard these things. And I heard lots of uh, older members. And, and I remember Rorker Stick saying, you know, it's the first drink that does the damage. It's the first drink. It's not the eighth and it's not the tenth and it's not the fifteenth. It's the first drink. And he'd hammer his fist into the table. And that was very profound. It was a first drink. And I understand that today because if I don't pick up that first drink, I won't get drunk and all the rest won't follow. But I listen to these men and they, they give me the good oil. And uh, Rorker, Stick all used, uh, uh, Rorker Stick also used to say, if we stay away from meetings, we pick up pots. No exception to the rule just a degree of time. And how true is that? How many times have you looked around in the meetings that you go to and where I go to and you see people just, you know, stay away a few days, stay away a week, stay away two weeks, stay away a month. And then you hear the news. They picked up a drink. They're in jail. Passed away. They're in hospital. You know, I've heard this so many, many times. You know, we've heard it in these rooms in the last week with a poor little girl called Melissa who just passed away and left a, a beautiful little daughter around her face and succumbed to this disease, this rotten, this dastardly disease, this insidious disease that kills people without them even knowing it. And this is what it was doing to me, you know. It was killing me without me even knowing it. So I'd come along to these rooms and I, I listened to you people. And slowly, nothing happened overnight for me, but slowly I started to, to, to get a little bit better. I got physically well. I started doing things around the house. I, I made a little garden painted the house with the guy that brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous. For the first two years, he he stuck with me and uh, he helped me so much around my house. We painted and uh, built a little uh, uh, chicken coop and, and 
put some, put a garden in. We did all kinds of things, and we went to meetings, and, and I'm so glad, you know, for the encouragement and the love that I got in those days that kept me hanging in there. And I got hooked up with Cheeky Charlie right back in those days, and he took an interest in me, and, and he became my sponsor. And, and for the first 19 years of my sobriety, Charlie looked after me, and then my second sponsor, Ian Jay, who's done a, a marvellous job in the way that he, he his understanding of the big book and the program and the fellowship. He's helped me so much. So both those men, you know, I stress the importance of a sponsor because a sponsor has done me so good. And Charlie took me through the steps and the fourth and fifth was, was very important to me. And the things I watched his example because he was an older member a member that got sober in 1954 and they did things the old way, like they used to go and 12-step people in their houses. They don't do that very much these days. It's mostly people coming from rehabs and treatment centres. But these people took me through the steps and um, introduced me to the big book. And old Broken Hill Jack used to say about the serenity prayer, you know, the mental diversion he used to shout from the floor. Use a serenity prayer as a mental diversion, you know, and just rotate it in your mind, you know, if there's something bothering you, if you're thinking of a drink, just keep rotating it, and eventually, through the mental diversion, that, that thought will leave you, you know. And, and I had to listen to these people. I needed to develop the willingness to learn, and keep coming back. I'd never had a system to live my life by a plan or whatever, it was just bouncing from hotel to hotel and the violence and the anger and there was so much, you know, and I thank God, you know, I got to Alcoholics Anonymous at an early age, a young age, because uh, if I kept on going the way I was, you know, my own wife said to me, you know, another year or two and you'll be finished. And I know that, you know, I know the way that I was going, the mess that I was in. But thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous because this program changed my life. It saved my life and gave me a new way of life. And it helped me to deal with those kind of things, those issues that have been around with me as far back as I could remember. The, the things like fear and the anger and the arrogance and all those negative emotional things that plagued me since day one and introduced to me to love and caring and sharing and be helpful towards others, stuff that was very foreign to me. And it helped me to make amends, you know, because I hurt a lot of people in those early days. And the worst part of it was what I did to my own family. And I didn't even realise that I was doing these things. It just happened. Especially when I went into blackouts, you know, and I'd say and do things. And, you know, and I'd wake up the next day and I'd get the feedback from what I did the night before and, and I'd be, no, that couldn't be me. I wouldn't say those things. I wouldn't do those things. But it did. I did. Anyway... You know, I had a lot of amends to make. And the first four years that I got sober, I lived in the same street and there was people in that street that didn't like me very much. <laughs> Not too many people did. Uh, they'd cross over to the other side of the street to get past me. And I don't blame them. But uh, you guys encouraged me to, to, to make amends and deal with the past. And that's what I did. Uh, it took some time. And I finished up. I paid every one of my bankruptcies off. My wife and I got stuck in. She got a job and uh, I had a good job through my sobriety, through the program. And we paid everyone off, all our bills, everything. And we got back to square one. And the phoenix is rising from the ashes. And, you know, life started to take on a new meaning and I kept on coming to these meetings and and listening to you people and at one stage of my sobriety probably two or three years in 
I thought there must be more to it than this, you know. I, I kind of got to that stage where I was sober but stuck. And I was trying to figure out why wasn't I happy as I was in the first year or two. And I couldn't figure it out. Anyway, I think I said to Charlie, you know, I said something to him. And he said, well, you've probably been playing around on step one too long. He said, it's time for you to get stuck into the rest of the program. And this is when Charlie... Uh, took me through the steps and we used to go and sit in his kitchen and we'd just talk and, and he helped me in those areas and uh, I'd never ever up until that point of time entertained the thought of uh, a higher power. You know, I'd listen to what the people were saying in the group, you know, make the group your higher power or the tree outside the meeting house or, or whatever, but I didn't give it too much of a thought other than that. And, uh, and I started to look in a spiritual direction. And it wasn't till oh, August 1981 when my wife's father um, had some health issues and it led up to his passing that I was alongside his bed on the night of his passing and I was standing there and I could see him suffering. He was struggling for breath. And he didn't look too, you know, he was really struggling. And uh, I had this feeling come over me, maybe I should pray for his soul. But I couldn't because I was so self-conscious. And there was other people around. There was other people in bed. There was vis people visiting uh, their sick ones. And, and I was standing there with this drama going on in my head. And I wanted to pray for his soul. I wanted to, to help commit him his soul to heaven or whatever you like to say but I couldn't so I had to pray for the ability to be able to pray <laughs> you know, it's strange but but uh, I did I had to pray for the ability to pray and and once I did that you know I just broke out in prayer for this man's soul it just happened more automatically and I believe that was a higher power and he was helping me and I cried out for this in prayer for this man's soul and uh, this wonderful feeling went right through my body and I, I talk when I talk about it I go back to the way it was that night experiencing it uh, the hair stood up on the back of my neck and uh, and I started to tremble and and that good feeling uh, good uh, sense of well-being uh, like there was air under my feet I was sort of hovering on the floor it was an awesome feeling and uh, he eventually passed away and I walked out the, the, from the hospital and I'm walking down the street with the guy that brought me into our college anonymous and I said to him, I said, yeah, Kenny, you know what happened while, while we're in there and, and I prayed for him. my father-in-law's soul and he said, no, and I carried on and I told him about it and he said, you've just had a spiritual awakening. I said, what? He said, you've just had a spiritual awakening because you, you accepted the the presence of God in your life. And I started to think about it. Oh, it's true, yes, because I cried out in prayer. Uh, I asked, you know, in, in, sincerely in prayer, praying for this man's soul. And uh, and God acknowledged me through the, the this experience. That's how I see it today. You might think differently. If you've had an experience like that, then you understand where I come from. But that was my introduction to a higher power. Uh, and from then on, I didn't uh, doubt the uh, presence of a higher power. In fact, um, I wanted to go in that direction more and more. And it's no different today, you know. There's no different today. I, 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 I got a love for God that I never ever thought that, you know, was possible in my early days. Because I used to make fun of my higher I used to make fun of God and, and Jesus Christ and all that kind of stuff back in my junior days but today you know I believe and uh, wholly and solely in the, the presence of a higher power and what he's doing in my life and and what he's doing in your life and and everything that's going on around me but I love this program this program saved my life it's given me a whole new way of living and and it introduced me the things that I never ever thought, you know, that I would be involved in. You know, in my early days of sobriety, 
uh, I took on uh, being secretary at meetings and uh, went on committees. I went on a sports committee for Alcoholics Anonymous, picnics committee, a dance committee. We did uh, seven dances straight, and I was on the committee for that, and uh, picking up members for meetings and uh, all sorts of uh, roundups and um, camps, all kinds of stuff. And it's given me a whole new way of life. I've learnt to be a, a giving person instead of a taking person, and, and that's been a struggle because I've got that natural tendency that I want to take, take, take all the time. But uh, through this wonderful program, Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm learning all these things. My wife, she is a giving person. And I look around the place and I can see lots of giving people. And, uh, and then there's people like me, you know. And, and that's through my arrogance and self-centeredness and, and the whole universe revolving around me. But I'm learning to be grateful and to be thankful and, and to appreciate you know, those little things in life, you know. I, I have a purpose today, a reason for living, and, and it's not all about me. I've wandered around planet Earth for many, many years thinking, you know, what in the hell am I here for? What's the real uh, reason for life? And I see it today as helping another person. It doesn't have to be an alcoholic. It's just about whatever we've been skilled in in an earlier way of life that, that helps another person, you know. It could could be in the church or it could be uh, in a hospital. It could be here. It could be wherever. But I've found that my purpose is carrying the message to the sick and suffering alcoholic as the message was carried to me, the message of hope, uh, your experience, strength and hope. And I've got a lot of hope out of Alcoholics Anonymous. But when I came here, I was wholly and solely and totally washed up. I had no reason to go on living. All I wanted to do was drink myself to death. But I learned from you people and what's said in chapter 5. It said, God could and would if he were sought. And I followed that path. And that's my path today. I, Alcoholics Anonymous means the world to me. It's my passion, it's my calling, and it's my reason for living. And these things I'm starting to understand. And anything that I can do for the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, within reason, I, like someone said here earlier on, you know, that I could never refuse uh, something for Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's, that's the way it is for me, you know, because I think straight away, this program, this fellowship saved my life. Now, I've got to do something in return. I've got a huge debt that I owe Alcoholics Anonymous, a huge debt. You know, if I chip away from it for the next 50 years, chip away at repaying it, and I could never repay it. But if I make myself available to another alcoholic of reaching out, well, then I'm well on the way to paying that debt. And I look back over the years, you know, that the reason why I'm here today with a good life is because those two men got together back in 1935, Dr. Bob and Bill W., and they went through all the dramas and they went through all the, all, all, all the rough stuff and, and all that uh, horrible detail of trying to get this fellowship up and running in those early days, they, all the trials and tribulations and stuff that went with it, but they never give up. They kept hanging in there right to the very end. And Dr. Bob said in, on his deathbed, yeah, Bill, please don't us this thing up. Keep it simple. And then um, Bill's, uh, when he died in 1971, you know, he was there right to the end. And you hear these stories. And I remember Broken Hill Jack um, Broken Hill Jack, they virtually carried him into meetings and he would wet himself. I mean, he's a man of nearly 50 years of sobriety and he never gave up. He kept on coming back. Even when the pain was, you know, another person would say he's had enough, but uh, not these men. These men are such powerful examples to me, great examples 
of this wonderful fellowship and uh, I want to follow in their shoes, you know. I'm nothing special. I've got a long, long way to go. But I hear so much. You know, I listen to you people through your experience, strength and hope that, that I've got a life today. And, and it's just in the simplicity of the thing. It doesn't mean that we've got to run around this planet, all over this planet, trying to sober up a, a million people. It doesn't mean they've got to run around this hometown of mine um, knocking on doors or whatever. But it just means that um, if I'm there and another alcoholic comes up to me and gets in my face and needs help, I am responsible. It tells us I am responsible. When anyone anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA always to be there. And for that, I am responsible. Now, you people did that for me, you know. You come out at night to pick me up, to take me to meetings, to make sure that I was okay. So it's up to me, you know. The, the, the ball was squarely in my court to be there and to be available for another alcoholic. That's the way this program works, you know. It's a love and understanding and caring and, and being there for another person and being grateful. And gratitude is a big thing in my life today, you know. That you people have done so much for me. And I could uh, go on and on and shout it from the treetops of my love and my, uh, and my appreciation for what you've done for me. It's my gratitude, you know. My cup runneth over with gratitude. I just know that I, I, I've been given so much. And it's you people that blow my mind. So I've got to keep coming back and do those little things and be there for those members. But anyway, I think I've said enough. But uh, I'd just like to say this this fellowship, this program saved my life one more time. And in conclusion, I would like to thank each and every one of you for the encouragement you give me and the love and the tolerance and the understanding and putting up with me, because sometimes <laughs> I'm not a very nice person. But without you all, you know, I don't stand a ghost of a chance. This disease is waiting over there in the corner, doing push-ups, waiting for one little chink in my armour. And that can come at any time. Old Gil used to say, you know, have you ever done anything on the spur of the moment that you regret? Well, I know that one thing that I could do on a spur of a moment that I would regret is to pick up a drink because I'd lose all this. I'd lose everything that's been given to me, so freely given to me, so much love and understanding for one stinking, rotten, filthy, lousy drink. That's how I treat the alcohol, you know. Old Broken Hill Jack used to say, don't give a mug a chance. Don't give a mug a half a chance. And the mug in this case is alcohol. So... With that, Janice, thank you very much for allowing me to come up and and share a little bit of my story. It's a lot longer than that. There's so much that's happened to me in 32 years that I would love to talk about. But because I've only got a few brain cells left, I can't, I can't uh, uh, recall them from memory, except for my gratitude. Gratitude, as I said, is a big thing for me, and you people saved my life. So I've got loads and loads of that, and I'll keep coming back. So thank you, Janice, and thank you, everyone, for having me, and God bless you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 